Okay, so um, hello everyone um, and welcome to the Archivism Lectures. My name is Bia Martin. I'm a senior lecturer at the Manchester School of Architecture where amongst other moving pieces, I coordinate the MSA Collective, uh, which is the school's wide uh, long program, um, cultural program. Um, the Archie Zoom Lectures, which meets uh, online, invites distinguished experts, visionaries, and accomplished professionals from around the globe uh, to share their insights and contribute to the exchange of ideas. Every lecture is set to delve into a wide range of topics, either directly or indirectly, that explore novel um, approaches to research-based education, learning, and professional practice. Uh, the series is driven by the ambition to showcase diverse modes and methodologies of design and design thinking, embracing the pressing urban, environmental, and social matters. I am delighted to kick off the first lecture with award-winning Portuguese practice CVDB architects, partners in life and work, Cristina Averissimo and Diogo Bonet, jump between Halifax, Canada and Lisbon, Portugal, uh, between teaching and practice. Uh, Cristina Verissimo, a graduate from the GSD and the Lisbon School of Architecture, has been teaching architecture for over a decade whilst an active architect, architect in practice. She regularly develops international workshops and exhibitions on the topic of cork and new uses in architecture since 2014, involving several researchers, sorry, uh, universities and industry. She is also a researcher in green building design and new uses, of course, as building material in architecture. She has been an assistant professor of practice at the School of Architecture at Delosi uh, University since 2013, and together with Dio Bournet, were the chief curators of the 2022 Lisbon Architecture Triennale. Diog Bournet received his architectural diploma from the Lisbon School of Architecture and is an MSc in Architecture from the Bartlett School of Architecture. He is an Associate Professor and was the Director at the School of Architecture de Los University since last year. He has taught widely from Hong Kong to Lisbon, from Minnesota to Texas. He sits as an advisory member at the Council of the Lisbon Architectural Triennale Foundation since 2014. Together um, with Cristina Verissimo, they founded CVDB um, Architetus in 1999. The practice work focuses on architecture's relation to the public realm in the context of a larger physical and cultural landscape and to the individual's experience and perceptions of spaces and places. Projects and buildings have been exhibited and published worldwide and have received national and international awards and prizes. The office blends different generations of architects and students working in a multidisciplinary team of consultants, landscape architects, and structural and service engineers. The studio is committed to the built environment and architectural research, developing each project as an open and participative field to all involved in the design process. CVDB recently won the international competition to develop the project of the Supreme Court of Mozambique, which is now under construction and scheduled to be completely in late 2024. And without further ado, um, please welcome Christina and Diogo. The screen is yours. Hello, hello, good morning. Bia, thank you for the invitation. This is a great pleasure and honor to be here and to share our work with your students. Uh, I am in Canada and Diogo is in Lisbon. So this is how our life is. We keep on commuting and organizing ourselves according to our teaching and working schedules. So today we decide to do a lecture that is not so much to show in detail uh, all of our work, uh, lots of it has been published and we would be okay if you want to share some questions or even to go to our website. But today we decide to our, organize our lecture into topics 
and the topics we're going to talk to them to see what is the things that move us when we are doing a certain design so i'm going to pass now the the microphone to diogo because he's going to be the first one presenting thank you so hi everyone um it's great to be here uh, connected uh, throughout the world via zoom i want to also thank uh, Bia for this uh, very generous invitation. As, as Christina pointed out, uh, we're going to travel through time, through several bodies of work, trying to focus on, on the things that matter to us, themes and things that we are really uh, intrigued uh, and motivated by. So this explains more or less uh, how our daily lives and geographies have been operated for the last decade or so. We are united uh, by the Atlantic and, and we share the shores of the Atlantic uh, where we teach and where we work and, and, and live. Um, one of the things that always has, in a way, been part of our values, who we are and, and, and the conditions that we try to to understand is is this uh, in a, this idea about inhabiting the edge so we, we've grown up we, we've uh, developed our practice uh, mostly in Lisbon and this proximity to the ocean this condition of being at the edge of a system of quite open to many of the systems is something that has been very much part of our lives as we've been traveling working around the world as well and um, so this idea of, of um, being close to, to, to something that connects us to, to other cultures is quite important. We, we also uh, develop this understanding that architecture has a profound connection with its um, cultural roots, uh, geography, topography, and, and um, the conditions in which we operate are very much part of uh, not only of our daily lives, but how we try to celebrate that. Um, throughout our practice. The, the unique and, uh, conditions or very specific conditions of the topography of lives and for instance have uh, inspired us for generations and for many years uh, in, in a way we understand how uh, cities are built over layers and, and how these conditions uh, some, that sometimes can be quite uh, challenging are really presenting us great opportunities for, for us to understand how people live in cities and what is the role of architecture in these conditions. Most of the work we do tends to focus on the public realm, on, on this relationship between architecture and everyday life. So we, we also understand or try to understand that um, the work we do is part of a continuous thread of history, of layers, of ways of building. And, and their connection with everyday life that has been constant throughout times is something that we're very much interested in. Uh, the other thing that we, we find is we mostly design and um, we have, oh, throughout designs is understanding of the role of materials and geometry. How do you design a place? How, how a space becomes a place? And, and so this is, uh, the questions through geometry and, and matter is something that um, we're very much uh, fascinated by. Also, as I mentioned before, this uh, understanding that um, whatever our contemporary condition is, that we are part of a thread that connects past, present, and future in everything we do. And yet we always design for the future. So we, we have our feet, let's say, on the ground, on the at the present time, but our hearts and minds have to connect the past, present, future in, in every, every body of work that we try to do. This understanding of culture uh, in this uh, thread is for us very, very important. And also, as part of architecture, we need to think a little bit about uh, how we design spaces that present opportunities for some ways of let's say poetic uh, dwelling or ways of uh, shifting the way we understand the world today it's important to understand that we don't work we don't work alone that we work 
in the community for communities so we are constantly presenting discussing debating our work with people within the design team and beyond the design team it's part of the work we do and we work uh, these are all of progress of the office and we work in a very open collaborative way with everyone involved in, in, the, in every single project so this is kind of the working environment that we um, have uh, designed built and 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 always uh, try to keep so that people feel always engaged and, and everyone who's part of the team feels they have a voice in everything that is being discussed we we uh, also believe that these are topics themes that have uh, been part of the way we understand architecture and and what this diagram presents in a way is 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 a common uh, saying in, in in portugal where in architecture every system of beliefs or values uh, need to understand that its opposites are also valuable as well so things like program landscape circulation but how do we understand that we we do not work under absolute uh, systems of values that we work with others for others and to be able to develop a way of listening to other voices in the way we design is quite important for us even if they sometimes can be quite contrary it is our role as architects to move forward with the sense of synthesis bringing things together and, and so this idea of the public realm that whatever we do, whatever scale of the buildings we design, we also have to connect that to the broader cultural and physical landscape. So the idea of mediating thresholds, how architecture and the landscape in whatever forms and shapes can in, intertwine with each other and establish kind of a more of a flow and continuous relationship is something that's quite important. Christina. Okay, so this is our, the first project we're going to show you is a cultural center in Cartacho. And we defined some topics here that we would like to talk to you, which is the public space, the continuity, the flow, the materiality, and the scale of space. Now, from this picture, you always see there is almost no trash hold between the pavement, which is the first horizontal line in this slide, and the, the room, the first room, which is the lobby of that cultural center. Diogo, can you move a little bit to the next one? Um, this is, this is a, a building that stands on the back of your screen um, and it's, it's a square and it's in, a, in, a, in, a, in the rural area in Portugal where people never been to the theater or a cultural center. So our first goal was really to make a building that could connect with the population and invite us in by being um, in the building. Um, can you move? There is something on the screen. Okay. Okay, so next slide, please. So these diagrams, and we work a lot through diagrams because it's a, it's a very nice tool to communicate with different types of people, but they are clear to understand that the building somehow um, engages what uh, with, with the outside and the inside. And it brings the population in through a lot of uh, dif different circulations uh, on the top uh, right image, Diogo, if you can present, where you have um, the circulation. So people meander around those spaces in that first lobby of the building. So in section, the building is pretty much, uh, it's a complex cantilever because all the auditorium room is actually supported uh, as a cantilever. And uh, what you could see from the section is that the first uh, space, it's quite public and is the lobby with different uh, mezzanines and different areas. And then the moment you enter the room, you are uh, directed to the stage, which is on the back of the building.
And this is images of the lobby. Again, the relationship between indoor and outdoor. How does the people feel two children are trying to understand what is the building inside? And uh, they are more than welcome. And the building is pretty much open to them most of the day uh, with just a thin layer of glass separating them. Um, we also design a lobby where people are also actors. They, they meander through the space and we design a space where different events can happen, such as in these images. Through time, the building has been operating also an exhibition space, event spaces. And these are some of the exhibitions that were existed there. Uh, music, the acoustic is something that we thought a lot. Uh, we would not expect this to also to be happen in some extra spaces besides the auditorium. The, audio, the auditorium has uh, is dedicated specially to voice, to the theatre, but uh, we have some devices that allow music to perform because absorption uh, comes as in the sort of panels that uh, occupy the space and creates more absorption. In here, you see other events happening in the public spaces. So these kinds of areas that we mentioned that are extra and the building also perform that activity. And this is how the building react to the public realm because um, there are people inside and outside, and it seems like a very large living room to the city. Okay, so this is um, a house in the same city uh, of the cultural center, and um, uh, this is uh, uh, this house has a, a particular story because this is someone who asked us to design this house for his family uh, after the cultural center had opened to to the public. So themes, uh, as Christina mentioned, such as the flow, continuity, and, and how, let's say, your body and your eyes travel throughout um, this small house were things that, uh, in, in a way, we, we could identify as ideas that were being developed um, also in the cultural center and and in 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 this house so what we see here is this um a small challenge that the house had as the topography uh, was um not very severe but um the garden at the back was nearly two meters below the the level of the main entrance and how through a continuous line of materials we could um establish that connection between the entrance and and the garden which is what we see here on on the left side on the right side as the material of the floor and material of the walls would uh, in a way establish that connection between um, the garden and and the street where all the public spaces of the house were on the lower level and the more private uh, spaces of the house were then on the upper level another thing that we introduced here which you'll see in several bodies of our work is the idea of using color as a material to qualify and or differentiate spaces. So here you can see the relationship between the entrance and the garden on the right hand side and, and the courtyard, the small courtyard that connects the office, the kitchen and, and the living spaces as well on, on, on the left hand side and the use of color as also an element that connects these different spaces. Christina. So this is um, a competition that we win. It's an older East center close to uh, Lisbon, close to Lisbon is in, in, in Oeiras. And um, what was important in this older East center was to create a sort of a way that people dwell in community and uh, in this topic, we're going to talk about continuity, city building garden, gardens, how everything intertwine, our circulations and the interrelations between the circulations. And what is this idea by performing community and neighborhood within the building? 
So the building is located in the outskirts of Oeiras County. Um, the, the, the is not very secure in terms of the daily life around the neighborhood. And so somehow the idea that the people could be safe in this environment was quite important, even though the building reacts to very important features in the landscape, such as on the top hill that you see in this image and the park. The building is organized in different floors and the, the ground floor is a floor that connects not only the entry uh, and the garden through different boxes that organize the program. But the, the permeability of the space through different uh, spaces that allow you to see the garden, even though you have to be invited in, it's quite something that we decide to do in this building. The materiality is very important. So the ground floor we used, uh, we are very attentive to spend money in our buildings. And in this case, we use slight material, but it was leftovers. And so the way that we pile those spaces were important and we use color as a material. Um, on the upper floors, what you're going to see is that the, the dwelling, it's pretty much the same matrix and repeats through the building. But then in the middle, there is a circulation to access the, the housing unit and the circulation keeps on commuting. Now, if this is the first floor, Diog is going to pass to the other slide and you're seeing the void and the circulations are different. And this is a section through the circulations of the buildings where you can see how different balconies overlook down and up. And this is quite interesting for the community because they talk to each other in different floors by coming to the circulation area and, and talk to each other. There are also some pockets that allow them to talk to each other. In this lower plan, we see the trick of how these circulations work because we fix somehow the infrastructures in one point which allow us to rotate always one unit left and right and therefore the location of the entry is totally different in every floor. The, the elevation, uh, we use materials that last for a long time such as tiles and in this case the blue tiles mark the, the um, morning facade and then in the, and the slate is the ground. And then on the other um, facade, the color is red and it relates to the garden. The garden is a space where they extend their public spaces, which are on the ground floor to the exterior, to the garden. And this is it, okay. Okay, so this is another uh, project that we're showing you. As we mentioned, we do a lot of competitions in this case, we apply for this competition, we end up in second, but it was an interesting competition for us. We learn a lot and that's why we share with a lot of people because the competitions, when we lose them, sometimes is already a winning for us because we learn so much with them. So landscape, the, the, the building stands in an incredible landscape in the park. Uh, the pathways, the central voids, intercommunications and references. Let's move on for me to explain a little bit more. So the building, it's pretty much an object that stands uh, in the air and it has that box is supported by a lot of infrastructures that are part of the landscape because they are semi underground. Uh, there are different layers for that facade to happen because we wanted to respond to the different locations in the building. So the facade would perform differently. Can you um, move to your, oh, that's it. Okay, I guess. <laughs> um, this is you, right, Yogo? Another competition for school of music. And one of the things we realized is that uh, whatever our conceptions of music and learning about music and, and musical scores, were really challenged, uh, and and just by working with a, with a musician, he was also a professor of music for young young children. And so, what we've 
felt for this competition was this idea of 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 let's say uh, sound bites, uh, sound geographies, uh, musical geographies as as uh, in as any given school of music. Uh, people who play drums and violins and and other instruments they have to find their own acoustically insulated spaces to practice and because let's say exposed spaces to to jam and and play together so what uh, we we established here was uh, a building that had a clear presence to the city uh, a building that would be like a, a black box uh, built with black uh, exposed concrete and then a series of voids would be carved as as if they were like silences uh, between uh, uh, notes between the uh, sounds and and those uh, voice would then connect the different uh, programs different activities within the building so this is how the building presented was to, were meant to be presented to the city itself uh, the, how the, the ground floor plan was organized in a way that you would enter and feel part of the flow with the central ramp as you can see in the section below and how the the yellow marked um, power circulation was designed in a way to, with spaces that were either wide enough or generous enough so that people could gather in almost every single corner and and play together or do something together. So you can see how varied the, the width of these spaces are in the central void where a uh, uh, big ramp would unite, uh, as you can see here, all the floors. So this idea of continuity and 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 uh, specific pockets of spaces was quite uh, important for us. Another competition for a museum of art and archaeology in the north interior of Portugal, and this uh, museum mostly celebrated um, the archaeological findings uh, carved in stones, and it had a simple program such as on the upper floor, as you can see in blue, the exhibition spaces, and on the lower floor, the cafe, the educational spaces, and the offices of those who, in a way, work for the archaeological part uh, of the park where this uh, building is located, where the engravings were located. So what we thought about here is this idea of reframing landscape in, in a, a very powerful landscape where uh, there's the Douro River and the port wine comes from. How would one connect with nature by reframing one's relationship with nature was something that we really um, were intrigued by. So this is, um, another project that we win, another competition. And in this case, it was uh, housing for uh, young people. Um, the contrast is interesting because our old center is on the left side of this image. So it was a compliment. And in our case, to imagine what to be uh, designed for young people was one of the things that uh, we, we would like to, ta to, ta to test in this program. Uh, nevertheless, the urban pathways is quite important. The construction urbanity of this building and the urban interconnections are fundamental. So let's move on. The building rests uh, in the platform and the platform relates to the park. There is a continuum of pathways, of public pathways that relate uh, this building to the park. And even uh, above the, the parking, which is an underground parking, we create a public platform where kids can play and the visual interconnection uh, between the street and the, and the park, it's uh, pretty good on this building. Um, we also create some voids, vertical voids, to allow the light, the natural light, to go inside of the corridor. So this building, it has pretty much all the spaces related to natural light. And we also uh, create some opportunities for balconies in this building so that people can see the children downstairs and so on. This is you, Duke. Yeah. Uh, 
and muting my mic. So the next uh, project is for competition. We got the first prize uh, more than a decade ago. This is a project that is still being developed and, and the program is still being revised by the Faculty of Medicine in, in, in the University of Coimbra, being the University of Coimbra, one of the oldest uh, universities uh, in Europe. And again, this was an interesting challenge because within the campus of medicine, there is a, the concept of the campus is uh, uh, organized around a central square, as you can see here, and and the buildings are very much like objects uh, that are the are more or less connected to to the square. So one of the things for us was quite interesting and important was this connection with the square, almost carving the whole building uh, from that corner and and making the most permeable and public. Uh, activities within this building closer to the square and the, this program required a lot of research labs that are very specific in their requirements and and several auditoriums and, and this building brought several different departments within the faculty of medicine so that was kind of an interesting challenge to to bring so many different ways of teaching ways of learning ways of practicing how you learn about medicine in one single building. And and we've, again, felt that um, with such a dense program, the voids, as you can see on the section on the bottom left, were kind of the crucial elements that would uh, carve out space and, and, in a way, enable through how noise, I say, people speaking through uh, these corridors, would establish a sense of connection within the different parts of the program of this uh, building. And so what you can see now in detail is how this corner towards the square opens up, how the ground floor on that particular corner uh, is as visually as much possible um, permeable, and how then the other pockets of the program all or organize always keeping in mind this voids that would travel uh, parallel to, to, to the building, as you can see through the sections. Here, the, the lower perspective shows the connection between the, the, the park on the left-hand side and the campus on, on the right-hand side. And in the section, you can see how these voids were key elements to design these, these relationships. On the bottom level, um, you have two major auditoriums for 400 people each. And this is very much part of the practice of um, medicine, medicine schools where you you always are hosting events and conferences where people are sharing their recent findings from the recent research. And this, again, the, the biggest void here, as you can see, um, would for us be key so that the whole community within this building would be aware whenever these events were going to take place. It's you now, Christina. Branca, Branca Freire is a school um, that um, is closer to Lisbon, in the outskirts of Lisbon. And this is a good example that we want to tell you about how the flows of the, the paths and the materiality, visual axis, and work with the industry was fundamental to actually achieve the design of this school. Now, the school, in, it, well, even in this image, you can tell that the site is not flat. Um, can you move the image, Diogo, please? Um, actually, the, the, the school responds to situations of the site, which is the green area, which is a valley. It has a very important street on the left, which is designed in red. And the initial school were just pavilions and the entries are designated in blue. So we start to subtract some of the pavilions and the others we kept. Now, uh, the, the strategy for this project was to create a sort of a ring that connects all the pavilions together. And in the middle, there is a sort of a void which you design it as a square. So in terms of the existing landscape, there, there was a retained wall that we decided to get rid of it during the design. And the design became 
a sort of a, a ring, some of it, it's standing in the air and allows the landscape to connect with the valley and the topography became a connector. So the entries were remaining in the same place. The main entry is where you have the two arrows merging together. So that's the entry of the school. And then we create that in that void, the so-called learning square. You can see the existing pavilions with the skylights, the square skylights on the top and the gymnasium, which is the standing alone pavilion. Um, this idea of the learning square, we also include in the learning street. So the school became a city within a city. And this is to say that even the rooms, the classrooms became part of this dialogue that we decide to have between the public spaces, which is the corridors and the more private, which are the, the classrooms the connection with the valley, the square. So how does the landscape interconnect and even issues of sustainability are embedded in these thoughts. Um, the main streets uh, are the same. We organize this having that into account and the entries. Um, so the, the school became a sort of um, we also thought of this as a children's game that everything repeats, some, some pieces repeat, such as the classrooms. The classrooms have a proportion that allows the teacher to organize them in many different ways in terms of how do they organize the tables. And then we were very attentive to the light, to the natural light. As you know, in the classroom, the light needs to be controlled in order the students to be their eyes to be focusing on the on the topics and therefore the control of the light was fundamental. We also use very uh, neutral materials. The classroom um, is is not even white. is is a certain gray color so that the, the, your eyes will concentrate and do not have to close because if the walls were white that would be an issue. And so this is the materiality. Of, of the classrooms. And then we also design the, the informal spaces. So remember when I mentioned the classrooms are all the same, they became a pattern that repeats uh, along the corridor, which is our learning street. But then there will be spaces where they have different shapes, even different colors that we call it informal learning spaces and where the students intertwine through the day. So this is a plan of the school where we show the circulations in blue. The, the vertical circulations are in yellow and then the reds are these informal spaces where the students study. Uh, the pavilions are there. And this is a, a circulation along one volume that is an exception, which is the auditorium, is located by the entry and where the students um, get together as a whole because it's the auditorium of the school. So it's the important box. The corridors, as you see, they are very busy. They have a certain height proportion with light going from above. Um, the, the absorption, the, you see some tiles on the walls that have different rhythms and those tiles are absorption tiles so that the acoustic is actually controlling these spaces. Um, this is where we organize the vertical uh, different because the landscape, as we told you, is not all the same. So we organize this into moments where the students have to drop a level, even though there is a, an elevator for people which cannot go down the staircases. And they became a special moment in the schools. And these informal spaces, such as this one, this is for a small group of students. And uh, we use somehow Barraga inspiration with the color and where the light is coming to actually design those spaces. So this is one, this is another space, informal space where you have an auditorium. The students a lot of times sit on these steps and talk to each other and they can even have performance there. So this is one of the informal spaces. The use of color in this school was fundamental. 
and we work with a consultant for callers. And this is one of our conversations with that consultant by using different callers and to see where they could be. As you see, there are not a lot of callers included, but quite a few and where we locate those was fundamental in this school. So we did design some prototypes because we were interested to see how does the light is protected. And in this case, um, as you can see, that shelter that goes a little bit above the window contains colors. So even though the students don't see the color, they see the reflection of the color in the classroom at certain time of the day when the sun is there. And so to, to work with reflection color was something that we learned a lot in this school. Um, the work with the industry, I show you the tiles before that were um, that we use for the acoustic purpose. Um, the, the tile on the right left is it's what the industry produced. And we went to them and we asked them to actually redesign in a better um, finishing material because this is an industrial block. Um, and uh, they, they said, totally fine, we can do it. We can even make the color that you want. So it became a gray color. And we also asked them if they could have different heights because the existing buildings were not the same. And we have sometimes to make shorter bricks in order to accommodate the existing buildings. And then in one particular location, we paint those, uh, those bricks in um, or cement blocks, if you want, in the, in the color blue. And this is the arcade that relates with the main square to the valley. And we wanted to design, it's the structure of the building, but actually became an opportunity for us to be to make a playground. And we designed these multiple shapes that organize the landscape. So sometimes the students use that ramp as an auditorium and they see these sport events on the side. And then we have these shapes were designed in order to accommodate different positions of the human body. So sometimes the students are standing, sometimes they are lying, sometimes they are sitting. So it depends because the shapes are have multiple shapes. Yeah, and this is the learning square. Um, the students love it. They used to say that before they did not have spaces to dwell in the outside because it was too windy. And now they have a space to dwell and they keep on saying they love the space. This is the entry of the building. We, desi we designed this sculptural staircase to go up. We like the students to use staircases instead of elevators. And this is the daily life of that school where the students go up to their classroom. So they use a lot. So the, 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 the staircases are also motivators to be used. And this is the main lobby. Okay, our next process is another competition that uh, we got the first prize. And uh, this was for this small tapestry that is unique to a small town uh, in, in the southeast of Portugal, about an hour east from Lisbon and the challenge here was to work on a building that was originally built as a hospital in the 12th century that the building had been used for many many different uh, purposes and here the idea of running a building in the main square of Reolos dedicated to the tapestry that is unique to this town seemed quite um, uh, an interesting opportunity. The ground level is where all the public activities are located, such as educational spaces, the administration, and the multi-purpose room. And the upper floor is where the temporary and ex permanent exhibitions um, are located. And you can see from the plan that the, one can loop around the building so that there's no let's say dead ends in the way one enjoys the, the collection and the exhibitions. The photograph on the bottom right is where the atrium is um, located. And again, this uh, we've used this device of the void 
uh, that connected both floors and all the programs within uh, the museum. Also looked at um, very specific uh, tapestry patterns uh, that the historians with whom we were working with uh, pointed out as being unique and, and as we needed to add uh, a, a new building to host uh, the educational services. Uh, we looked at the tapestry, as you can see on the right hand side, and, and produced um, laser cut panels inspired on that tapestry to present the tapestry as, as an urban entity as, as well. Um, another project um, that for school, um, this is a school that, that ranges from kindergarten to grade 12, just before you go to university. It's in the outskirts of Lisbon. And uh, it also had the challenge of uh, having a bit of a topography between the lower street and the upper street and being attached to a convent that had been partially abandoned for decades and decades. So you can see the convent on, on, on the left hand side and the, the new additions to this uh, site uh, on, on the right side. And the, the school included a gymnasium that was a huge building mass that we tried to uh, mediate that by lowering it one level so that the present indigenous would not be too imposing and and uh, too much in terms of the scale of the new building and its relationship with the convent. Again, what we always uh, uh, felt for this project was that um, we wanted to have this uh, central courtyard, this playground area open to all ages so that kids of different ages could actually play together and obviously there's a kind of a playground management in terms of time of release from classrooms that allows this um, space to be very very much used at different times of the day. Um, as you can see a lot of circulation is taking place around this this, uh, this courtyard and, and again on one of the bookends of the courtyard the this system of ramps that would enable anyone um, in spite of whatever mobility modes one can use to move around from level to, to level. Behind this ramp is where the gymnasium is, which is something you can see on the right-hand side. And, and um, attached to the gymnasium is where the ramps that you saw before are located. And as you can see, the whole addition level, the roof level is below the level of the main level of the convent, uh, as it, one can see from the street above. So, Mora is this, a, yeah, you go. Okay, this is the megalithic museum of Mora, is again a competition that we win, uh, which has a particularity, uh, in terms of the site because it was an old train station. Now, the megalithic uh, topic in the country is really, really important because as you can see, all these dots are actually something in the landscape and there is a concentration in the middle of the country where we have the museum. And actually the, the museum is to, uh, to let people know the importance to visit the landscape. So the museum will not contain a lot of objects but it will be an interpreted center for people to visit the landscape. So can you move on? So the location of this was actually an old train station. The population used it as a reference building. They did not want it to be demolished. And so we used the two existing buildings of the train station to accommodate the museum. However, because it was, uh, we had, we need more space. We include two extra buildings on the size of the existing ones that are connected uh, because they are all separated, but they are connected through the landscape and by, let's say a corridor, a long corridor on the back where the trains used to exist. The connection with the landscape are very obvious through those gaps between the buildings. And we use the existing buildings to perform activities such as, for example, the warehouse now is a multi-purpose room. And in blue, you see the corridor that connects with the park. 
the like I said, the population is very attached to this building. A lot of events happen in the front of the museum, and this is an example of one event that happened. Um, the, in between the buildings, you can see there is the corridor, and you already, through the materiality, acknowledge that the materiality covers not only the the corridor, but also part of the proposed buildings that we designed. And the, the shape of this pattern, it was inspired by the megalithic people. They were fascinated with the triangles. Uh, we believe the triangles were a mean of communication and identify the families. And what you see in that image is a drawing of pieces in the landscape that we found and they are done in stone. So the bottom left image shows that. So we we use that as an inspiration and we defined multiple purpose, multiple panels with uh, those pa that pattern, but we were interested on the reflection of the light. So even when we were testing the panels, like you see over there, we were interested what would be the reflection of the light through the panels. And um, of course, by looking from the back, there is also this idea that the train in that old train station uh, was used or would be there. And so this corridor is actually also a memory of the old train as a connector. And this corridor is the connector of the buildings. The, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> this is uh, me too, Diogo? No, it's uh, meant to be me. Okay, sorry. So <laughs> the students, the students, so this is a, uh... An interesting topic that has been developed I'm quite sure around the world is, is uh, the crisis of housing, how housing, affordable housing uh, shortage is really um, presenting different kinds of challenges to especially to younger generations and how, let's say, universities by obviously having a lot of younger generations uh, studying, how can they help contribute to media what seems to be just um, market, uh, the kind of capitalist driven um, rentals um, of, of accommodation with, with a sense of infrastructures that could um, also um, help balance uh, students and fam their families' uh, financial balance, uh, balances uh, every, every single month. So this is a campus in the West, uh, outskirts of Lisbon. It's a new campus with, with uh, buildings being built uh, since the mid nineties up to today. Campus has several faculties but never had a student's residence. So what we felt was quite interested here, interesting here was the need or the care of the university to, to, to build um, a program that would uh, allow people to use this uh, part of the city for much longer periods of time throughout every single day. So as you can see from this uh, plan, there's this idea of the central avenue with, again, several buildings scattered around this main avenue and you can see the location of students' residence. Students' residence, um, we uh, had a simple urban strategy, which was to present a building onto the streets so that in a way, um, it, it, we were more concerned about how do we build uh, this, how is this building going to be part of an urban fabric, not so much as an isolated object but with, with uh, a strong presence on the street, hoping to contribute to how these streets are then lived and, 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 and enjoyed uh, by everyone who either walks up and down or drives or bikes uh, throughout the spaces. The bottom levels is um, where all the common programs are. And then on the upper levels are where the, the single, double and universal uh, design bedrooms are located. Um, again, the building is organized around this courtyard that brings the community together. Uh, the arrows in blue, as you can see on the top left drawing, point out that uh, between that building and the building on the right hand side, which is the university canteen, there's the opportunity to have a, a small urban 
pathway that would, in a way, connect the Faculty of Architecture building that is north on the top of the slide to the canteen and to the residence, the students' residence. So, in a way, we use the, the topography to establish a connection between the different streets that are part of the urban fabric. Also, we thought about using brick, which is a material that has almost no maintenance uh, to, to provide a sense of age, ageless, let's say, or timelessness to this building. And because brick was mass produced, we, we um, wanted to provide a sense of density in terms of how one would walk around the building. And, and, and the, as you can see, the bricks that stick out and stick in would provide a great variety of shades throughout the day as 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 um, as students would walk by. So you hope hopefully would slow down and pay attention to all these subtleties of how the brick was laid onto the facades. And the rooftop um, has a magnificent magnificent view towards the Tagus River, and we. Um, propose the, the, the rooftop to be kind of a gathering space for the students' community as big as possible due to fire rated um, and, and fire exits and occupancy constraints that uh, this space uh, could have. You, you can see here the relationship between the building, the, the white building being the faculty of architecture, and the, 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 the building on top of that, which is the veterinary, veterinary school where the brick is extensively being uh, used. The use of uh, economic materials, uh, in, in a way, the budget for this building was very, very tight and very constrained. And, and yet trying to figure out through programmatic strategies, how the street and the courtyard could be connected with each other. So the slide on the right, you see kind of a, on the right, on the left-hand side, you see the street. On the right side, you see the courtyard. So, it's, again, ideas of permeability, flow, visual connection between streets and courtyards was something that we were very eager to, to explore. The building was built under uh, in two phases. So the second phase is um, still under construction, but this idea of the courtyard um, is something that's quite central. And the variety of the windows as well was something that we wanted to provide so in a way the building because of the repetitive nature of the program we wanted the windows to establish connection between the bed the, the table and the door of each bedroom so you would walk in or you would sit down or lay down and you would establish different relationships between your private bedroom let's say and the surrounding landscape uh, we use colors as well to differentiate the different corridors, the different floors, and and we also painted then each fire exit uh, in a very particular color, so you, one would have a sense of guidance throughout the building as you're looking again um, around the building. This is the ground floor plan, and you can see the common spaces are, are indeed connecting uh, the courtyard and the street of your road how then the typical floor would present itself with, with some common spaces as well for students together, a small kitchen where students can cook, and some longer spaces where students also can take care of their own um, clothes and, 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 and wash their own linen, et cetera. So with the facade and the street in the street, as you can see on the right hand side and, uh, and the street on, on the left side and, and with the, the kind of really, level of the courtyard, uh, mitigating of nearly a, a four and a half difference between uh, both, both, both streets. And these are just the fire exit stairs. Uh, we've been told that students uh, actually um, use the, more the stairs than the lifts themselves. And, and uh, the way um, this concrete was painted and natural light comes in and the space is ventilated is something that uh, we feel pretty good at that. Again, the use of color in these corners, uh, infrastructure is being all visible so that uh, not only one can learn about uh, how buildings work, but also one can have easy access to any any maintenance related issues. The small pockets of, of collective spaces throughout the corridors 
you can see that we also use a break in, in the corridors. Again, we've, we're concerned about using materials that would require almost no maintenance whatsoever. And it would be resilience to the use of the students uh, throughout this space. Uh, we're very much interested in, as Christina pointed out, uh, and Bia pointed out, in Christina's research around cork. And cork is an amazing material. It's very abundant in Portugal, but has amazing um, acoustic qualities. It's quite comfortable, thermally speaking, and it's very eco-friendly. So the, the floor of all the bedrooms are uh, done in, in, in cork. And you can see here, how small the bedrooms are and the articulation between the, the wooden elements for the wardrobe, the bed, uh, the doors having the same colors as the doors of the corridor, and then how one needed to accommodate the ducts that would guarantee that all these areas were properly serviced. So this is just two views of a single and, and, and double bedroom. Again, the way the windows would allow you to establish a playful, mess, or a playful relationship between the inside and outside. And this is what we meant by, by the, the bricks coming out and, 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 and dented uh, going in to provide a, a, a greater sense of texture in the way the brick would work for, for this building. View of the courtyard, as you can see the transparency on the bottom level. Christina. So this is an urban design project. Um, we were asked uh, by, well, it was a competition, an invited competition, but actually it was, the, the, the issue is that there is a town which is called Cruz in Portugal, where they have two levels. Um, the height between the two levels is pretty much seven floors between the two levels levels and they ask us to imagine a possibility to have a, a circulation a universal mobility uh, point where um, the population could go up and down especially older people or people with uh, less mobility so we study multiple possibilities and the elevator became the decision and so the together by adjusting the existing staircases in the city plus this elevator uh, the, the strategy was to turn the city um, with universal mobility for the population so um, the city is beautiful it's been there since the roman times uh, but the two levels are actually uh, an issue and so what you can see are images of how difficult some people engage by going up and down that staircase um, every day, uh, multiple days, uh, multiple times of the day. So the idea was to study, we had a multidisciplinary team uh, with landscape architects, engineers, to actually study the, the area uh, a lot of the area, we are not making an intervention, but actually we are preserving green areas, uh, especially because the hill is really steep and uh, it's, it's important to maintain the landscape to provide for the future. And so the strategy was actually to design an elevator. Uh, can you move, Diogo, a little bit? So the elevator... It's, it's going to be a reference point in the city. This is a model we did, and then it connects with a, a viewpoint um, that the population never had before. Like, how can they see from above the city? Because that area on top was never used for them. And then we provide a lot of paths and opportunities to engage with uh, fountains that uh, arise from nature. So it was all that uh, sort of strategy that we designed. Um, so the elevator became um, a piece 
that uh, intertwine with other points of the landscape, not only to the high points, which is that viewpoint area, but also with the resting area on the bottom uh, while you're waiting for the elevator. And we could see that a lot of people will stay in the beginning of the staircase to have conversations. So that became an opportunity for us to have a small canopy for people to rest either because they just came down the staircase or because they're going up, but there's a meeting point um, that we designed. Right. right. And this is our last project. This is a project that is now under construction. This competition we won some two years ago. And this is from this uh, rather unique program, which is the Supreme Court of Mozambique in Maputo. Uh, this is close to South Africa, and one of the key elements for us that was very clear at the beginning was this uh, simple idea that justice justice needs to be and present itself equally to all. So the idea of uh, developing a circular building would uh, present itself to the city in a kind of equal, um, equalitarian way would... Uh, was something that is, was quite important. The building is located around the edge of what is downtown Maputo, and the building organizes itself around the central courtyard where circulation, circulation is shared for everyone, where you enter, uh, for those of us who are going there to either to the library or to take care of public affairs, and then throughout the, this courtyard, one then organizes the whole program vertically. So you can see these are early sketches where the whole program is organized around the central courtyard. Um, the relationship that the building has with the rest of Maputo, how we manage to deal with the topography, the, the building is also very close to, to the water and how by having a perimeter that would be bigger before than the required net area, we were able to provide a series of suspended gardens scattered around the building. So in a way, those of us who work in this building could also be always connected with nature um, in, in your daily, daily lives. Um, this is just a plan of how the building and the garden and the central courtyard is organized, how one enters on the right hand side and how one navigates through these curves and how the building is connected to, to the garden. The building uh, has a central court, um, auditorium and um, it, it's also a central piece in a way because it celebrates how traditionally justice or community affairs were always taken care of under the shade of a tree. So one of the things we explored was the, the presence of wood and the themes of uh, different rhythms that, that let's say as if we were navigating or meandering through trees in order to arrive to the space that is more clear where we can gather. This is an image of the entrance with triple headroom. And um, the building is going to be built in mostly white concrete. So we have a, an idea of a simple material that connects uh, all the spaces. And as you can see, this is the main auditorium. It's going to be all clad at, um, in wood. And this is the auditorium, the space where the most formal activities of the Supreme Court take place. Um, studies of the, the facades showing a, a sense of uh, diversity and, and differentiating the different levels. So in a way, um, the building would not be um, just about repetition, but about variation between the several themes. This is a study of the facade facing the courtyard. And this is how the building presents itself uh, to, to the garden. The shifts of scale, uh, we were very concerned about the building not being overly too monumental, but we also needed to understand that the building celebrates a, a very symbolic and key program and, and function of any given society, which is uh, the Supreme Court and, and how um, the judicial system 
that, as we understand it across the world, uh, is important. Uh, as as we often hear, if there's no justice, um, it's very hard to understand how a community, how a society, can live together. I think this is it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely riveting. Um, thank you so much for sharing um, so much work, uh, so much amazing work. It's it's really striking in, in, in two points. One is really nice to see the beautiful blue skies of my country uh, <laughs> in, in all the images. So I have to just put that note out there. Um, I'm I'm particularly struck stricken by um how towards the user your architecture is how carefully not not just tailored and in in a beautifully sort of kind of a design but how much in 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 in, in all the process uh, and work it's so evident that your architecture is for the people uh, 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 above all else. So what I'm going to just see if there's any question in in the box uh, or if anyone would like to just raise their hand or just jump in. Um, I know for, for some of the MSA uh, uh, students, uh, you'll be in, in class time at the moment, uh, but maybe you can just... Uh, um, sneak in one question and take this opportunity. Um, let me just see if I can find any. Probably while you're waiting to say something about what you said. Yes, architecture is for people. And uh, we are very attentive and careful when we design and even attentive to different cultures. Um, so things that we do normally even if we are in the stage of a competition, we go and visit the site for sure is the first thing that we do. But we also spend time looking at people behaviors. How do they use the city or what would be their expectations for the building? So uh, I talk a lot with students when we are designing schools. I talk with older people when we are designing houses for them. But we also look with an attentive eye what could be the strategies for a certain design by acknowledging their difficulties or their the things that they love. Um, if it's the shadow, of course, the shadow will be there for them and things like that. Maybe small things. Um, uh, we are also very attentive to money. How do we spend the money? So that's why resources is a limited thing for us. And uh, working with the industry or working with the, the constructor to understand and how to facilitate things. So this is just to um, start to talk a little bit. Uh, I, I, absolutely. It was, it was striking. I, I've I have to say, particularly, I was uh, quite um, riveted by by the schools, uh, and you know, it, it, I know it in some ways is a cliche to say, but you know, providing marvelous spaces <laughs> to to study, they they have to 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 really uh, excite uh, um, and want you know students to actually go into school, um, and they were they were just. Uh, quite striking pieces of architecture, but but so socially uh, aware. I've just seen uh, um, something popping in. So this is for Jeremiah. Um, hi, thank you for the lecture. I wanted to ask about the role of sectional drawings in your design process, since your projects showcase solutions of topography and scale through the section. Excellent question. It is. Diogo, would you like to start? Hi, Jeremiah. Thanks so much for your question. Um, we 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 started this presentation as an attempt not to focus on a particular project, but to to also question ourselves in, in how there's a lot of things we we do that um, 
seem to work in very similar ways. And 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 so the section, the way we work, uh, design strategies through sections, uh, is quite crucial. Most of the sites, coincidentally or not, uh, we've been working with have either a gentle or a, a quite severe topography, and that is kind of a really interesting challenge when we want to connect uh, bottom levels to upper levels. So we we also strongly believe that the way one starts um, sketching ideas about light, about scale, about materials, uh, th those drawings in section are drawings that can even early on be quite inspiring for the whole design process. It's almost as if you can, we're trying to map an idea or a question and then we spend most uh, the rest of the time in the design process trying to figure out what's the potential of that um, way of working and way of mapping things. Um, so this, this presentation actually started by just having one project and one sector. Uh, and and uh, obviously we felt that we needed to try to, to, to explain a little bit more the context in which we work. But um, I think that's, that's a very well pointed um, element in, in, in the way we, we do the work. Uh, Christina, I don't know if you want to add more. Absolutely. I mean, we still sketch a lot in the office. And one of the things we do first, of course, is the section. Our projects are, um, we play a lot of three-dimensionality in this way. The section is fundamental by understanding the different connectors in different highs. Um, uh, the, the culture of the Mediterranean is used to work with, um, with the topography and we make that part of our design because we understand and how to control sometimes, for example, in that school, uh, the students were complaining when we start the project about the different levels and how to make the levels possible for them to dwell without not using the elevator was an issue for us. So the, somehow is like the control of the landscape even dwell with that uh, circumstance that there are different levels. It, it's, it's one of the major thing in our designs, absolutely. So section is fundamental. I was muted. Uh, another excellent question on the box. Um, many of this is from Max Gomez. Um, many of your projects took into consideration sunlight as a primary feature. Uh, is it possible to make architecture for the people without using sunlight as an important factor? For example, if the living learning space is underground, if so, how hard he, or easy would it be to achieve this? Sorry, uh, good question. Dio, would you like to be the first or shall I? <laughs> I was going to say, you, you it's your first. Uh, it's got I, I would say uh, okay. sunlight, um, light brings life to every single living form. Um, it, it, either sunlight or indirect light or artificial light, but it's the presence of light that uh, in a way makes um, us... Um, those of us who are visual uh, beings, let's say, be able to dwell and, and, and to read and to speak with each other. I, I, I would say even underground spaces and a lot of underground spaces we've either visited or studied, um, there's always some sort of light coming through uh, the cracks or um, dimmed light or zental light. Um, uh, traveling vertically through space. And one of the things, for instance, when I showed the, we showed the perspective of the faculty of medicine, that void is, is two floors below the ground level uh, uh, on one hand and three stories below the, the, the square level of the, the faculty, uh, the University of Medicine campus. And, and I would say, it's an interesting challenge to bring light to spaces in many different ways. And um, either natural or artificial light, light is uh, 
you've given of all forms that say we we without light we would be um just um uh, let's say either um challenged to understand everything through our odors our hearing ability so i think the interesting challenge would be how by um how do we balance how our senses perceive and design and, con and conceptualize space and how, how do we look at uh, the way taste our ability to hear our ability to see our ability to to smell let's say and to touch how would these different things um could could come to play in in the design process that, that's a really cool question but obviously we come from the military and, and belt so how we play with light and also how we play with shadow is quite important as well. I, I, I really appreciate your question, especially because it was so detailed in going to um, education. Well, I mean, Diogo already said a lot, so I'm not going to repeat that. But um, there are one space in our schools that most of the time we create as an indoor space, which is the auditorium. Because of the location, because of the multi-purpose activities that they perform there, it's possible to have an auditorium without windows, although we try to bring light. And in these auditoriums, we always provide skylights um, in order to the light to be used if they have certain events that allow the light to happen. And even the quality of the light through the skylight is possible to have a sort of a special class there and the students even draw or, 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 or write down. So the light is, the quality is enough. Um, however, um, for the well-being of people, we understand not only the importance of the daily light, but the fact that your eyes not only look at the paper, but they also have a distance to look that could be the, the, the classroom where the teacher is writing, or even a window that your pupil could go zoom in and zoom out because that's, that's important. Right. So think about the natural light. I think for us is fundamental. We'll try to bring the light as much as we can, even if it was a situation of an underground thing. Yeah. Um, we have a, a few more. We have one from Maria Figueiredo. Um, thank you for the lecture uh, and for representing Portugal. <laughs> uh, what are your views on how do you approach compromise? This is a very good question. Okay. Um, we, we have a few others after, so maybe we're going to try to be more concise. Diogo, would you like to answer this one? I always thought about this as, as something that's fundamental in the way we work. We, we, and in Portuguese, for those of us who do not understand Portuguese, uh, the words compromise and the word, uh, the word commit is the same. To be com committed and to be compromised is almost, it's the same word. So I always wondered about how can you, if you're committed, you have to be prepared to compromise uh, as you're working in a discipline that is not enclosed. Architecture is not a self-enclosed, uh, self-celebratory discipline or field. It's, it's a very open, very porous field. So how we compromise with each other. Christine and I work together with people who work with us as we want them to have an active voice and, and this ability to listen to even sometimes contrary voices is quite important. So I, I would say that um, if you're ready to compromise, you're ready to be committed uh, at any given time. That would be my answer. And it's a very neat question. Thank you, Maria. Excellent. Those mixes of, of, of language are just so beautiful. Um, another one from some um, Siddharth. Um, hello, this lecture was truly informative and thank you for doing this. Seeing the project, some projects are carefully curated with emphasis 
on the exterior elevation and others with emphasis on interior details. How do you determine what's more important and allocate okay. budget for it? Okay, so um, thank you for this. The, the questions are amazing. I'm, I'm so happy. So uh, in fact, when we start to design, the dreams are there. We open the possibilities and the opportunities to do things without, in the beginning, sometimes the budget is not our first goal. The first goal is people, to understand people, what is this design for? Uh, when we say people, we also understand their culture, their way of living, and, and also predict what could be the transformations of the building in the future. So we start by almost looking into possibilities in the future together with this. But then we start to say, what is really important? After we develop so many ideas, it comes to a point that, that even if Diogo tells me, oh, I think we have to drop this. And, and I say, no, but that is important because of. So it comes to a point that we know as a team which are the important things that no matter what, nobody can take them out of the project. Like going to very synthetic ideas that we will fight for them. And then is when the budget matters because sometimes we have to compromise. Sometimes is not the ideal things. As you could see, a lot of finishings we subtract um, an example of that is the school, but you have in so many other places that we almost no, have no finishings. Our walls provide what is necessary in terms of acoustic, in terms of performance of the wall, but it could also be an aesthetic element. So we subtract budget in so many things, even finishings, if that is necessary. Um, I, I, I could just uh, I could add as well in terms of let's say how do we manage budgets. Uh, one of the things, for instance, uh, in the school, um, contrary to the students' residence, in the school we don't see any single infrastructure in in the public spaces. So the way we design common spaces is something that attracts a lot of our energies because those spaces is where people meet, where people circulate, where. Um, unpredictable encounters can take place. And a lot of times it's through these um, unpredictable uh, conversations that a lot of creative conversations or creative thoughts, uh, creativity can take place. So our care for what is common, what is enjoyed by the greater number of people is, is um, uh, extremely um, important for us. And then like classrooms or bedrooms, they have to be simple, resilient, as we have spaces that are being used intensively by many different people. And also in relationship to the facade, again, durability, maintenance, uh, resilience, uh, a building that doesn't look old a few years later are things that are very important for us. And so, the, for instance, the use of prefab panels in the school the brief fabricated concrete panels in the school, although with, with a challenging geometry because of the sunlight orientation, was something that we knew that we had to convince the client, the Ministry of Education and the school. And one of the key elements was um, the cost of maintenance, the cost of early investment versus the cost of maintenance. And, and so those are things we need to do. We need to work with producers, manufacturers, uh, with the industry so that when we propose something, we have the ability to demonstrate how we are budgeting for these things. Thanks, Hugo. That's, I think, a great segue for the next question by Irina. That says, uh, hello, thank you so much for the lecture. I was curious if you noticed any shifts within the industry when it comes to materials. The COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the war in Ukraine, resulted in costs raising when it comes to steel and concrete in the UK and other countries in Europe. From your recent experience, do you think uh, this might allow natural materials to be used more within the construction industry? Um, I guess I can answer that. Partially, the answer was already answered by Diogo. I 
probably will focus on the last part of the question. Yes, there is a huge transformation after COVID-19. Um, we were already interested in uh, not so much natural materials, but local materials, and at least to engage in the industry, local industry. Um, depends where you work. I would say that um, the North Globe, it's filled up with specifications, regulations, and so on, that are very difficult to understand if we propose new things which are not yet regulated. Okay, so this is a problem because um, uh, you have to follow the rules in terms of legislation. The use of natural materials, yes, for sure. We have to look into that in our uh, discipline, uh, but most than anything, we have to be very attentive how do we use materials, being natural or not, because the resources are limited. And uh, timber became a material that nowadays we want to use more, but there are also limitations in the landscape for the harvesting of this wood. And please always look where the materials are coming from because they might come from um, Amazonia and I'm worried about that. So be attentive where you prescribe your materials and where is the resource come from. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was going to say that more than natural is 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 the distance between the resources, how much transformation we need to implement, and where they they are being applied. Um, um, so that the, the using the thought of using readily available materials that can be easily replaced in any given place around the world is something that will um, need much greater attention, as Christina was pointing out. Absolutely. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, I know that you are taking your own um, Thanksgiving uh, uh, day to, to be with us, you know, Zooming all across uh, uh, the other side of the world, um, where, where I, I can't be more grateful for um, for hosting you here uh, through uh, MSA, um, and an amazing, amazing, uh, um, exciting, and inspirational uh, talk. I am sure our students and all that were present, and and all those ones that will will watch uh, um, this lecture then on YouTube. I uh, can take so much from 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 the work that you do. Um, I I do have many other questions. I'm I'm very curious about how you connect, you know, academia and 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 practice. But I I understand that we're we're we have gone through a little bit more than than our time. Um, but we are hoping that you will come and visit uh, at some point soon, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time to to. Uh, to ask all those uh, missed questions. Um, so I, I, I just really wanted to thank you again for your, for your time, for, for sharing your, 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 your work. Uh, um, and I am sure that all our presents and all our students in particular, um, um, this has been so, so wonderful for, for, for their uh, uh, journey uh, uh, in education. So thanks. Thank you very much uh, and enjoy your, your, your Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. <laughs> There's a, a Thanks, lot Ian. of thank you. Thank yous on, 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 on the box. Please do have, have a quick uh, note. And um, that's all for, for us from us today. And um, again, thank you so much. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to you soon, hopefully. Yes. Thank you. Definitely. Bye-bye. <laughs>